as you know, we lost our oldest son in 2020. Awesome kid, great athlete. He got kind of deep into it. Anyway, he went to rehab and then COVID hit. He bought like a tiny amount of drugs that had fentanyl in them. You hear nothing about fentanyl and it killed more people under 50 than COVID did. I'm assuming that the death of Sage was fairly public. The music community was unbelievable. Just wonderful. Uh, Tim and Faith lived at our house basically for two weeks. My brother was unbelievable. Their school communities, the sports communities, unbelievable the amount of love you get shown and something like that. At Sage's funeral, I said, I told the kids, when you're speaking, I just said, just treat alcohol like a loaded weapon and drugs like a ticking time bomb. When did you know it was time? I was in L.A. We were uh, shooting as the as the bar band in the movie Flicka with McGraw. My wife had gotten my phone bill and it was she was super calm. Calm is scary. Oh, calm is <laughs> terrifying. She said, I'll drive you to rehab when you get home. And that's it. I'm done with you. You're the father of my kids. I hope you get help, but I can't be part of it. I announced to the lady at the counter, hey, uh, I need to check in. I'm, I'm never drinking again. <laughs> she said, well, well, cowboy. <laughs> Slow down. Slow down, cowboy. Before I toss it to Jack in less than a minute, allow me first to introduce today's guest, singer-songwriter Brad Warren of the Warren Brothers. From 1998 through 2006, Brad and his brother Brett released four records, were judges on TNT's Nashville Star, and starred in CMT's first reality show, Barely Famous. Over the past 15 years, they have focused on songwriting, having written 15 top 10 singles at country radio, including nine number one hits for artists including Tim McGraw, Taylor Swift, Blake Shelton, Keith Urban, Leonard Skinner, to Steven Tyler of Aerosmith. Here's a quick word from Jack and our sponsor, followed by the second part of episode 24. Enjoy. Jack and Around Show is presented by Lone Star Dry Goods, a curated collection of handcrafted quality goods with a truly unique Americana vibe. Visit Lone Star Dry Goods in person right here at the World Headquarters in historic downtown Abilene, Texas, just west of Fort Worth in Willow Park. We're online at LoneStarDryGoods.com. Oh, I love the concoctions. Oh, I love the concoctions. I smoothie every day. I had to jumpstart that diet, man. It was like, you can't come back fatter. <laughs> oh, they, I don't know if Cumberland Heights, if you're familiar with that, but everyone comes back to me fat. The food is so good. Yeah. It was, everyone it, it gets a good. chill away. Yeah. It'll get better before, it, I mean, it'll get worse before it gets better, but then it'll get, yeah. All of a sudden, there's like this energy and time in the day, and it's like, oh, I'm... I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to. It's amazing the time. Just the time. Just the time. I mean, I just looked at the clock. It was noon. I'm like, wow. I feel like I got a full day. <laughs> my alarm still on? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, whenever someone says, I don't really have time to go to these meetings. And the guy will say, so how, how much time did you spend at a bar doing nothing? Right. Nothing. That is fun to watch. There was a guy uh, that I was just with. He had a meeting with, it was just kind of that same deal. He had a meeting with the, to start a cooking show that he missed the meeting. And he's like. By being in rehab, you mean? No, he missed the meeting by because oh, he was drunk. Okay. And he's like, <clears throat> he goes, I could tell you countless stories of how it was so important to me to be at the bar talking and pontificating and learning things about myself and this other person. I don't remember that person's name. I remember what we were talking about, but I remember the next morning missing that meeting. Best friend you're <laughs> never going to see again. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even, I don't even do that. Like when I've literally told people like, they're, I said, man, I, I can't do coke talk anymore. I'm sorry. I got to, I got to butt out of this. <laughs> I, can't, so I can't do it. No, I, can't, I can't do coke. I can't, just can't do it. And I called, we were on a plane last week. My wife's sitting in the middle. I'm on the aisle, and this guy comes in, sits, and he's already drunk. It's noon. He's drunk, and then he gets two drinks, and he's oh, he's talking, he's touching her, and he's touching me, and he's how did you think work? And we had shit downloaded to watch, and he's trying to get his Wi-Fi working. And he's like, well, hey, what's this? Hey, what do you do for a living, man? Well, kept on and kept on and kept on. I finally just I said, hey, man, I know you're drunk. And I'm cool with that. I get it. Believe me, I get it. But I said, you're done. Don't say another fucking word. <laughs> Sit back. Don't touch my wife again. Don't touch me again. You're done. And he goes, well, I didn't know I was offending anybody. He just sat there. He didn't say another <laughs> word. I, I mean, I was literally ready to jack his ass. If we hadn't been on a plane, I probably, I was like, you're done touching people, talking. Oh. So interesting, man. I was with a buddy 
and we used to get high all the time. And uh, I was sober, and he smoked a joint, which is nothing to me. You know, yeah, it's yeah. nothing to any of us. But I, it was the first recognition of me going, oh, this is very different being. He's kind of an idiot. <laughs> kind of like, he wants to, to find this deeper meaning in this conversation, and it's just it's not, not there. I'm just not there, man. That's so funny. That is so funny. It, it is interesting how uh, judgmental I can get on the really, I, by the way, pretty good at talking to someone with a buzz, whatever, but of course. just totally shitty drunk. I'm, I can't do it, man. I can't do it. I'm, I haven't lost enough brain cells yet to continue this conversation. <laughs> right. it's just, yeah, my name is, this guy, it would be different if he was hammered and I could tell he's looking for help. Oh, no, but no. It's just hammered and you're like, no, no. Eh, uh-uh. hammered wanting to become friends. Go, hey, man, let me get your number. No. We should go hunting together. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't go hunting anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is it interesting to be a country musician and not hunt? I just don't. It, I just man, don't. If I had a nickel for every hunt I've been invited on, I'm like, uh, I'll play golf with you. I don't hunt <laughs> or play golf. It's amazing I have any friends. I just don't like it's my buddies that play golf. I'm like, you don't make it look attractive. You're so pissed on a day. And I'm also really competitive. So if I'm not, if I'm going to suck, I'm just not going to do it. And I see how obsessed they are with it. And it's all they do. I'm like, oh, man, I ride motorcycles and every day I come home alive. I won. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, no, but yeah, it is funny. Hunting but doing anything golf. intricate, riding bike, riding motorcycles. Yeah. Anytime, especially being sober. Uh, like I've like most people drink on the golf course because that's how they learn how to play golf, and that was part of the. It's a social occasion. But I played golf. My brother was like when is a was a college golfer and could have gone pro. I was a real golfer. Okay. Yeah. And so I and I was never that good because I never really practiced like that. But I was good enough. I'm good enough to where anything that's intricate to where your hand being here versus here makes all the difference in the world. That's where I get off on that yeah. stuff. Cause you get in, yeah. it's just like songwriting. Yeah. You get inside of it and you go, okay, here I am now. Now yeah. it matters. Yeah. And like everything else, there's a lot of room in good, but there's a really tiny bit of room in great. Yeah. You know? And so just that little tweak is, yeah. I'm right. obsessed with, that's why I love talking to you. Like I'm, I'm obsessed with people that excel especially to a certain level where they can have control over those muscles. Just the people that are great, what, whatever it is. Cause like, it's like Tom Brady and Tiger Woods. And there was a time when I was drinking, I hated those people because they were just good at something. <laughs> I totally admire people that have something done. As a matter of fact, like I, my new thing is like fitness, man. I love, I love it. And I always kind of poo pooed that oh, yeah, they're, they're not, they're not balanced and whatever. It's just me and being lazy. Like yeah. if you really, and it is, that is also tweaky. Like these little things that you do with your diet and your, I would have never thought I would be that guy, but I love it. It's yeah. Like, like, it's a hobby. And you you hone in on it and you yeah. get inside of it. There was something about <clears throat> that goal. To- and I'm obsessed with it. If there's something that's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. That's <laughs> a good addict would say. And, and this, so I, that's part of the why I don't play golf because if I did it, it would become, yeah, you I'd get be into that guy. It. Yeah. You get into it. It'd be too much. So when did you know, when did you know you were, it was time. Okay. So I knew it was coming, you know, like I said, and I was waiting for the DUI that never happened. Um, I was in LA. We were uh, shooting as the, as the bar band in the movie Flicka with McGraw. Was oh that? yeah. So we're out there with, with Tim and we're staying in a house with his band. And it was just, this this part, we, I was just partying, um, hanging out with, with just some crew guys in a band in this big house. And, um, my wife had gotten my phone bill and just called every number on it. And you could kind of track what I had become there. Um, and it was, she was super calm. It was, you know, there's a lot of fighting going on, but she's super calm. Calm is scary. Oh, calm is <laughs> terrifying. Calm is the worst. And it, ter- it scared, scared the hell out of me. I was like, oh my God, my babysitter is done babysitting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to die. I really did. I was like, I'm going to die because she's done fighting about this. She said, I'll drive you to rehab when you get home. And that's it. I'm done with you. You're the father of my kids. I hope you get help, but I can't be part of it anymore. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God. So I sat there. In LA for like five days, stopped drinking, stopped partying. Right, right then, 
and waited till I got home. And it was just crazy. I should have got an airplane and flown home, but I still did my two minute part in, uh, <laughs> oh, right, right, right. in, in this, this movie. And, um, I flew home and she drove me to rehab and I, it's funny, you know, it's one day at a time and they go into all that. I announced to the lady at the counter who was probably just a secretary. I said, Hey, uh, I need to check in. I'm, I'm never drinking again. <laughs> and she said, well, well, cowboy, <laughs> slow, down. slow down, cowboy. Uh, she said, well, it's one day at a time, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. I said, no, no, I'm, I'm never drinking again. And to be fair, I haven't drank since then. So I won. Right. <laughs> I was right. She was wrong. Yeah. Woman. No, but one day at a time. She, she was absolutely right. Um, it was, it was coming, but it was all going away. And I, I knew I was going to lose my kids. I just didn't want to not be here. And it, it was, it was already not fun. I wasn't getting high. I was getting less low. Mm -hmm. Um, it was just maintenance thing. And I was physically felt like crap, spiritually bankrupt, emotionally. I lied about everything. Um, it was just kind of, I was kind of grossed out by who I was. I would kind of come to in a room full of people that I would have never been in a room with and go, oh, what am I what? doing here with these people? And I'm like, Oh, you're, you're one of them. And I would look in the mirror and be like, Oh my God, this is not the person that you're, that your parents raised or that your wife married or whatever. It was, it was bad. It was ugly. And um, so I, in LA, I just decided I'm done. Came home. I went to rehab and it's not like it's life has been perfect. As a matter of fact, life has been very imperfect. Uh, I've had worse things, bigger events happen to me in sobriety than I have before. Um, as you know, we lost our oldest son in 2020. What was his name? His name was Sage. And uh, he was 21. He's an awesome kid, a great athlete. He went to East Tennessee State to play football. And, um, you know, he'd always had little problems and um, with, with substance. You know, he, he came by it honestly. And, um, he got kind of deep into it. Anyway, he went to rehab and spent a year as like the greatest kid in the world. It was amazing. It was like the best year I ever had. 2019 was my favorite year of my life because I, I watched this kid get healthy. It was awesome. And then COVID hit and there's, you know, there's all kinds of reasons, but he, um, you know, he slid off and started smoking weed again. And then he, he bought like a tiny amount of drugs that had fentanyl in them, which is crazy. It's a whole nother subject, another podcast, but you hear nothing about fentanyl and it killed more people under 50 than COVID did during right. COVID time. Wow. Um, it has, it's crazy how little airplay it gets. But, um, I always had kind of an agreement in the back of my head with God. Uh, you ever take one of my kids, I'm drinking again, mm -hmm. you know, all bets are off. And, uh, the truth is it's kind of gone the other way. I've become like, like I, I get angry at drugs and alcohol on a, on a regular basis. And, um, I started a, a a group of men that have lost kids that we we meet once a month at my house, and uh, it's been really healing. There's a lot of things in life that are better because I not it's attached. I know I'm not really a very churchy guy, but I feel God, and I never really did before because mm -hmm. I want to be close to my kid, and I think that's where he is. Yeah, and I feel him when it's close to that. So I really um, I've kind of delved more into recovery than than I was before. And it's kind of takes on a different, a different uh, texture sometimes, but it is not, I haven't even thought about, I haven't thought about drinking or using don't, don't, don't want to and wouldn't. And um, when that happened, did you, did you feel like you were walking towards the fire or did you, or was it just not even like your, your deal that you had? Hey man, all bets are off. Did that even come into play? It, it didn't, it didn't end a crazy. I mean, just passing thoughts. It's funny because my wife of 26 years who went through all this with me, who almost left, who should have left. She said, you know, we're, we're just flattened, um, holding on to each other to keep it, which I'm so grateful for her because marriages tend to go one way or another really quick with, with uh, the loss of a child. And she said, I don't even care if you drink again. I'm not, I wouldn't leave you. I'm, I don't care if you drink again. I said, yeah, you would. You'd leave me. <laughs> she said, no, I wouldn't. I said, you wouldn't leave me for drinking, but you'd leave me for who I turned into when <laughs> yeah. I'm drinking. You've forgotten. Um, so there's passing thoughts of it, but not really. Um, it's just so, there's just so much, there's so much more life there without it. And I blame that shit for his death and the idea that it's, dangerous. And, and I, you know, I talk to kids, do anything. I'm going to do a podcast uh, about grief, which is, I know you look at me and you think there's a guy that would do a podcast on grief. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Not so much. Yeah. Well, that, that looks about right. But the truth is it's, we've gotten into like helping people in grief and it's become our thing, just like recoveries, trying to help people that have substance abuse problems. And uh, that's kind of become a real 
mantra for, for our family is just helping people through those times and recovery kind of ties into it. And I don't know, I've probably become the thing that my, that my mom always wanted me to be, but I just don't speak in tongues. Right. <laughs> right. Well, you speak a different language. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Honesty. There's yeah. a different language. That's a different language. So when the sage was in high school, did you know, did you kind of see, did you recognize yourself? You're, Oh yeah. Yeah. A lot. And, um, he was like me, but better at everything. He was better at sports. He was better at looking, but he was like what I would have been if I was a little better at everything. He's just, and he also had a little bit, even more of the gene. I started late, but he started in high school, um, had some challenges, but it was like weed and drinking and we would, you know, we would put him on restriction and keep him home. And it seemed like it was workable and he was a sweet kid. So I just assumed that he'll get it together like I did. And he did get it together. It was great. Um, going away to college, kind of scary. Um, and that was like, you know, he was at East Tennessee State, which is about four and a half hours away. So we didn't see him as much. And that was when, the you know, the claws were off and we couldn't watch him. And it gets there. But, I, yeah, I saw a lot of myself in it. And then, you know, you go through, when you lose him, you, you, you for a, a short period of time, you blame yourself. Yeah. Like, what, what didn't I do? The truth is, we did a lot. And the truth is, from the time he was six years old to the time he was 21, it passed. He never saw me drink. He never saw me drunk. He never saw me high. And um, as time has passed, I take a lot of solace in that. Because if I was still using and this happened, whoo, yeah, I would have put the blame on myself hardcore. Um, and the truth is that you can't, I mean, you can't get someone sober. You can't get them drunk. Right. They, they eventually wind up doing their own thing. You do what you can. Now, um, when he passed away, was it kind of a fluke? Total fluke. It was, it was a tiny bit of drugs, fentanyl. I mean, it was just a tiniest bit, but, um, so it wasn't an over, I called it an overdose, but it wasn't, it wasn't an overdose. Like he did a whole bunch of drugs and it wasn't, but he wasn't anything. falling off the cliff. No, no. He was, I talked to him the day, day before we worked out together at my house. Um, we were supposed to work, work out together the day, well, the day leading into the night of, um, and it just, yeah, it was very fluky. And, but we had, we had worried about him. I have two other sons and they're both really, really well behaved. Uh, not, but we always did worry about him. He was, he was volatile. So I, I got the call. I was writing and I got the call and I'm driving. I'm screaming in the car, like yelling, God, just give me one more chance. An overdose will wake this up and it'll be it. And just, it just wasn't the thing. And uh, talk about things you can't control, but it's made me take my hands off the control of everything. Cause there's very little that, that I control. Yeah. And so uh, I'm better at everything. I'm a better dad. I'm a better husband. I'm a better guy. I, um, I run to the fire instead of away, f away from it. Mm -hmm. This is something I wouldn't talk about if it hadn't happened to me. Right. And like, you know, you, your friend loses a child or a spouse and you don't really know what to say. And so you keep your distance. I don't keep my distance anymore. I go right straight up to the door, knock on the door, sit with them or whatever it is. And it just wasn't something that I would have done before. Mm -hmm. So it do re really does make you better uh, at everything in life. It's a shitty way to have that miracle happen. but. Like there's a God that I'm in relationship with now that I really didn't know existed from my time in Baptist church and right. whatever. It's a, it's a, something that kind of gets you through every day um, that I, I wasn't really aware of before. Where does, where does, where does it live? Your, your spirituality, like, is like, you know, there's a lot of people that struggle with figuring out, like if they have, if they have a, issue with the concept of organized religion. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's an issue, man. I that mean, is a big, that's funny. Where does it live? Okay. So here's the difference. If I were to say, honestly, currently it lives with me all the time versus I don't really currently go to church. I mean, I will go, but it was always like, okay, let's give this an hour a week or try to be a better Christian or whatever it is. Currently kind of lives with me all the time. It's there. Cause I want to be close to him and that's where it is. And I think that's how it's supposed to be. Like I told uh, my mom, who's a lovely, wonderful woman, but she's very the church lady. And I said, mom, I am sure of this. God doesn't want me to wait till I stop saying fuck to get close to him. <laughs> it's true. He wants me to come to him now, like I am, <clears throat> and let him give me the grace. And maybe one day I'll stop saying it hasn't, <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. But that's the thing. I stopped trying to earn something that's not earnable. Right. Just like sobriety, whatever, it's grace. There is a, there's a, a grace period, uh, grace space, I should say. 
in life that's literally you only get from that. And it comes from a surrender thing. So it kind of lives with me all the time. Now, versus living with me, I'm pretty the same all the time. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty the same guy. Like I used to be different in front of my wife because I wouldn't want to offend her. Well, the truth is, I, I'm just myself all the time now. And there may be some eye rolls when, when I laugh at that's what she said or whatever it might be. But I'm, I'm, this, I'm comfortable with the, the person that I am pretty much all the time. So yeah. you stop like catering to the crowd that you're around. So because of that, when you're trying to help someone or you're talking to someone, they're pretty sure that it's real because they can s- smell the lack of bullshit on, right. on what you're delivering. They to saw them. you before you were trying to counsel them or whatever. And it's like, this is the same guy. And if I was trying to counsel someone before, it was because I thought I should and and whatever. And I, 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 by the way, I'm an active guy in recovery. I sponsor people and I do that. But it comes from a a genuine place now. Like I really want them to be better. And that selfishly, it helps me be better. Right. Yeah. How's your wife deal with it, man? Like it's crazy because she's really good. She's a, she's like the opposite of me. She's patient and she's, kind and she waits for the time to get healed i want to be all, i want to be the like i want to be the best guy at recovery <laughs> i want to be the best guy win. at grief i'm i'm gonna win the grief olympics right so i'm gonna be so the second week you know i'm ready to go have a fentanyl campaign and and have a men's group for you know for everything and uh my wife is more patient but we make a good mix because what's crazy is like my bad days are rarely her bad days so we kind of can support each other in those bad days. And, and she's not in recovery. So sometimes I'm like, damn, I wish you had this. Like I have a few groups of, of people that I can just go to. And she has a group of, she has a group of people, but my group's a little bit bigger. And I have a few of them because, because I have the recovery piece, people that really go through the, the recovery thing and get it for real. They're pretty good assets when, when the shit hits the fan because they're there. Yeah. And it's not just lip service and they're not worried about how something looks and they don't care what, that's another thing, like worrying about other people, how they perceive your parenting. People are going to think I'm a bad parent. It's the worst thing you can think of, right? I don't care. I know how much I love my son. I know what kind of parent I was. I'm aware of the, of the shortcomings, and I'm comfortable with the efforts. And, but caring what people think goes so deep in us. Like We think that everyone's – it's funny. You wouldn't worry about what other people thought about you if you realized how little they did. Yeah. They just – they don't – I don't have enough time to deal. It's kind of like worrying about the hit songs. Just don't worry about it anymore. I'm trying to do the next right thing. Worked really hard for my son. He's with me every day. I don't ever not think about it. That That is there in, in every moment. But it's not so someone else would think I'm a good parent. Right. Not so someone else would think I'm a good guy. I want to actually, crazy as it sounds, I want to actually be a good guy. Just be a good guy. Wow. Just be. (laughs) Just be a good guy. Is that crazy? So. Was Sage an artist at all? No. No, he he was an athlete. He, he, it's funny because my wife. Were you an artist as a kid? Yeah. 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 I was, I was a, I was a musician from like, I've I've been playing guitar since I was 11. So I was. Hmm, Doesn't show. Music. (laughs) (laughs) I would say F you if I knew you weren't kidding. (laughs) But um, he would dabble a little bit playing guitar. And, and, and one of my other sons plays a little bit too. But my wife was like tone deaf. And I told my kids earlier, I said, you guys have like half talent. Like both my parents were musicians. Right. So you guys have just enough to get you interested in something you're not going <laughs> to excel, gonna excel at? at. Yeah. So he dabbled, but he, he's a really, he's a really good athlete. Like he was a, he was a, he was going to play? play division one football. He played baseball and football. Played all what three position? sports in basketball. He played a wide receiver and corner in football. And he played outfield and baseball and he got an, an, a little offer to play college baseball. And then he was going to East Tennessee state to play football as a preferred walk-on. So it means it, that was his thing. Um, and uh, I was kind of happy that, that because kid with substance issues early on music business is like, it's fraught with, God, it's not, yeah. you know, it's not only not frowned upon, it's actually smiled upon uh, yeah. to be in that. But uh but he, other than this, the sports versus music thing, uh, he was, we were a lot alike. He was very much mini me in ways, which gives me uh, pleasure. And sometimes and it also gives me guilt. I'm like, man, that kid was just one, one gene too much like me. Right. You know? Right. But, I mean, but just imagine how lucky we were. Yeah. Oh, with all the trials, you know, experimenting and, and getting into it. It's like, I saw I saw a billboard one time that said just because you made it through all the shit doesn't mean everybody does. No, <laughs> I know. I I've said 
a bunch of times. I did what he did the night he died a hundred times, yeah. hundred, at least a hundred times. <clears throat> so at that point you kind of go, it'd probably be the same for you. God's got some kind of plan. What, what, however much you believe in, there's some sort of plan. Cause I probably shouldn't be here. Right. And you probably shouldn't be here. My brothers probably shouldn't be here and half the people we know. So there's some reason. Yeah. Like for the survival. Like God, I know you probably did the same thing, but like, I look back on times where I'm like, people were like, come on, man, slow down. Or do it. I'm like, I can't die. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like, surely I'm, I remember waking up and going, Oh my God, I made it through that. I literally did. <laughs> right. I would wake up and go, Oh, I can't die. I literally, I can't believe that I just woke up and I feel pretty good. Right. Yeah. The strange thing about being bulletproof is that, you only you only get to be not bulletproof one time, and then you're never bulletproof again. Wow, That's exactly <laughs> right. You only get to be not bulletproof one time. Yeah, and it's you know, I told uh, at Sage's funeral, I said I told the kids when they were speaking, I just said just treat alcohol like a loaded weapon and drugs like a ticking time bomb because alcohol a loaded weapon's fine, but you just got to be careful with it. And the ticking time bomb, man. Keep that shit, <laughs> keep that shit away. Just keep, keep it away. Cause you get a lot less time. You get a lot less time to, to mess up with that. Yeah. It accelerates the whole thing, especially nowadays. What, I mean. Five, four, three. Like what can you do in five seconds? Yeah. <laughs> Alcohol will just slowly ruin your life and kill you. <laughs> right. Drugs are much quicker with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll be honest. I, I kind of, I, I was pretty much ready to die at the end of my, I mean, it just, I just, no specific reason. I just didn't, there wasn't a whole lot to, I was kind of a slave to the whole thing. Yeah. And how are you? How are you? You have two other boys? Yeah. How old are they? 18 and 22. One just graduated high school. One just graduated college. And uh, they're good. They're, they're good kids. They, like they have real jobs? They, uh, the the 22-year-old is, is a scout for, he went to Western Kentucky University and graduated from there. And he's a scout for the football team. That's his job. So he just You're got, kidding. Yeah. And that's what he wants to do. And the other one's 18. He has no idea what he wants to do, which is perfect. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want him to. Yeah, no. Yeah. So when was, I'm, I'm assuming that the death of Sage was fairly public. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially was. in Nashville. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was. It was. Uh, you know, it's funny. It's kind of a blur because you know. I mean, I literally got messages from people that I didn't even know knew me. Uh, wonderful. The music community was unbelievable. Just wonderful. Uh, Tim and Faith lived at our house basically for two weeks. They were there every single day. Um, took care of our family. Uh, my brother was unbelievable. Many friends. I mean, just a lot of, a lot of my friends were just there. Um, their school communities, the sports communities, unbelievable the amount of love you get shown and something like that. And I kind of was like, man, of all the things that I may or may not have accomplished, somehow we built a group of people around us that are just amazing. Um, and it's humbling. Mm -hmm. Like, it's funny. I can talk about this and not get emotional about it. But when, if, if I start, if I get into specific things of kindness, people did, it makes me, I get, I get weepy about the kindness is real weird. Cause I'm not really comfortable with that. Right. But uh, yeah, it was pretty public. There was, um, yeah, we, he, he had, yeah, it was pretty public. And, and, uh, I don't know. I don't do social media, but I posted something when there's a Warren brothers, Facebook page that, that, uh, we put a picture on once a year or something that's there, but I, I wrote something for him and, um, it like, like 200,000 people read it and there's only a couple thousand people on our Facebook page. So, um, it was a public thing, but it got to, got to be something. It was a, you know, a platform to, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not preachy about like, I'm not going around talking, get that beer out of your hands and whatever. Although it's funny, you can get that way after a while, a little judgy, but it gave a platform to be able to say, Hey man, here's, here's where hope lies here. And by the way, I don't know how to get through grief. So I just got a bunch of guys together and let's figure this out together. And it's unbelievably helpful, just like recovery to be with other people that feel just like you do about something right. versus there's something about that plastic sheen over uh all religious broadcasts <laughs> it just you know made me go oh god you know and just not having that but talking about god and death and life and purpose and all those things without the religious right crap around it has it's been really cool you know it's funny man i just back when we used to listen to the radio we'd be driving in the van 
and you know, every 30 minutes the, the stations would change over on yeah. the FM dial. How fast were you driving? <laughs> <laughs> fast enough. <laughs> fast enough to not be welcome in Arkansas. <laughs> yeah, <it's> like- <laughs> but I used to, you know, you press the seek and I could name that Christian station in three beats. It's that, that sheen you're talking about. It was. Even on the radio. Even on the radio. You yeah. could just tell like yeah. right away. Is, even before the lyrics start, you could just. Yeah. There's something. And I'm like, there's, there's definitely a God without that. Yeah. And so that's, that's the there's, guy, there that's the guy to, I know. There has to be a God without white Christian music. Oh, oh. <laughs> I was going to make t-shirts to say, even Jesus hates Christian rock. Yeah. <laughs> that's terrible. That's terrible. I, I, I was saying, even Jesus takes American Express. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's something about that sheen probably because of how I grew up, but it was, it's interesting to kind of discover like, like a, a, spirituality and a God. I, I mean, I, I believe the concepts. I believe in Absolutely. Jesus. I do. I believe, I mean, I do believe not just the concepts. I believe in Jesus and he rose from the dead and he died for our sins. And I do believe all those things. Um, I don't know why we have to box it with the exact terminology that we do when I'm in an AA meeting or right. I'm not supposed to say a, but whatever it's when I'm in a recovery meeting, I always try to pretend like someone's, this is their first day. So don't start using a bunch of terminology that they don't understand. The pretend their first day. I wish church had that about sinners. Yeah. Would they understand if someone walked off the street and said, man, I really need some help. I need some God in my life. Is your thing going to speak to them or is it going to be, are we discovering the Greek terminology for the word sacrifice? And we're going to well, delve into that. I, I completely agree with you, man. It's the, it's the thing about like when you go to, to an AA meeting, that sheen is like, what you don't get in church is the person that comes up and goes, Oh, you're fucked up. I was fucked up. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I'm fucked up. Like you don't get that. It's, it's a, it's all about whether or not the, the little six year old girl looks cute in the first row. And it, that just gets in the way, man. I mean, that cute, that little girl is cute, but what you want to do is go up and talk to that girl. Go, you hate, being dressed up right now, don't you? Yeah. She's like, you fucking hate it. You hate your mom for this outfit, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> and you miss that because it's all about that. That It's not all about, but in the wrong way, it can get too much it about. It can become all about that. Yeah. And I always say AA is church with the F word. Yeah. Which gives it a certain grit that maybe you don't get. But I AA is a church for me because it's, it's people looking for God in a really honest way. Uh, some of them I agree with, some of them I don't. But yeah, it's it's when we uh, what is it? The ch- church has become like a showcase for the righteous instead of a hospital for the for the broken. Yeah, um, that was Ashley McBride. We wrote a That's song with her good. called Six Flags Over Jesus." And there's the a same. line in there that was hers. It's so good. <laughs> you know, you're talking yeah. to a songwriter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, I already, Where did, got, that come I already from? did that. I wrote that one. <laughs> <laughs> don't get any big ideas, in your room. <laughs> <laughs> but but that was kind of her line. Yeah, and the song, and that's the truth. You know, we it's it stop being uh, stop being a hospital for people that need it. And it's it kind of let's showcase our righteousness. And I hate. I think some people probably have a different version. I grew up in so much of that. The whole condemnation God with the lightning bolt. I just I needed a different avenue. Yeah. I always picture we're walking to the same cross, and there's just different paths that we take. And I'm I'm not going to get locked into one. I'm just jumping. I'm hopping. I'm hopping pads like you did at the water park when you were jumping from slide to slide. I was never yeah. good at that, <laughs> but I'm good. I'm good. I, at the, so good. I think of it as a spoke. Remember those mm-hmm. wire spokes in wheels? Yeah. Oh yeah. That to me is the concept that I, that I'm comfortable with of like, there's a, there's a energy in a center and however you get there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I believe in a God that would be like, like in my mind, I, I talk, I talk, kind of say this to my brother when he gets on it. Like if he gets I, on the religious. Yeah. Okay. And if I go, I'll just be like, Hey man, if I show up, it, you know, and there really is everything that, that people talk about the God I believe in would go, <laughs> you fuck up. Come here. See, man, you were wrong the whole time, but I look, you know, come on, get in here. Yeah, exactly. It's just, I got a buddy and he doesn't really believe in God, right? And we were childhood friends. And I said, and so he, he has a, like a 10 year old son. I said, how much do you love your son? Oh my God. What wouldn't you do for him? Nothing. I would do anything for him. Would you die for him? Yeah. I said, that's God. 
Otherwise, why would you care? That is God. Why would you care about any other person? Because it doesn't physically do anything for me. If there was no God or no presence, regardless of what they say in church or how it is, that love that you have for that kid that's not you, that you would do anything for, that's God. Yeah. And he goes, okay, good enough. That's a good starting place. So I'm I'm not going to help the the Bible scholars figure out things that we haven't done. But I'm I I say I I've gone back to the beginning and gone. Okay, let me start this over and put a different spin on it. Yeah, and it's the same God. When you take I away said, all the baggage that you got growing up, uh, uh, I, you know whatever baggage I got growing up about it, it's like it's just it, it can get so simple. I just go when I get the chills, either listening to or writing a, a song. That's God. That's God. Yeah. When, yeah. when, when you connect with somebody and you go, Hmm, we have no, re- like if you're from Tampa, Florida, I'm from Houston. We had no reason to meet, but we did. And 20 years later, we're right here talking and meaningful conversation. It's like something that's God. That's God. That's God. God. That's God. God. <laughs> There's a connection here. What's your uh, religious background? It was, ours was kind of, um, it wasn't agnostic, but it, my parents were really, they were just post hippie. Oh. I mean, just, just pre hippie. So they graduated college in 63, 64. Okay. And we were, we were celebration Christians. Easter. Oh, yeah. Christers. Yeah. <laughs> Easter, Christmas. <laughs> you know, that's why I never went to church on Easter. I'm like, everyone that never comes here is on Easter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, so, which has provided, it provided a lot of leeway for me. I was going to say, at least the canvas w- wider open. You probably don't have the the uh, baggage. I didn't have the baggage. Have the, yeah. In fact, my it, the baggage that I got from my from my spiritual upbringing was uh, was is is what the hangup is because it's my ver- ver- version of it is so non exclusive, and that's where I get hung up with 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 organized Christianity because I'm like, love is has no denomination. <laughs> and Jesus kind of hung out with me and you. Yeah. That was his. That's what I mean. Like Jesus was, laughs at my jokes. Yes. I swear he does. Yes. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. And he thinks they're funny. Yeah. The exclusive, uh, I can't even remember which religion it is, but they think there's like a hundred thousand people going to heaven. I'm like, man, I am screwed in that, <laughs> yeah, in that world. I may as well not even try. That's the wrong bar. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, I always like to think that whatever grace that I've learned or whatever grace the nicest person I know have, God has more. So I'm going to be okay there with that. This, yeah. is, this is helping me live here properly. It's funny. You lose a kid, everything kind of changes. So my purpose, I'm not, I used to be trying to live forever. I'm not, I don't really want to live forever, but I want to live fully right, and correctly and with relationship and with substance for whatever time I have. And it's different than before. I was literally just trying to miserably succeed at getting to 90. I don't know why. You know, so true, man. Why? I mean, maybe that's age for us because we're the same age, but yeah, the whole idea of, I used to think, oh, a hundred, let it be a hundred. First, make it. And my wife's like, you're not going to fucking let it be a hundred, man. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the way you live. <laughs> you're already a miracle, man. <laughs> yeah. But then once you started kind of looking at it soberly, it's like, yeah, I don't care how old I live to be. Right. Just as long as I can. One of the things that got me getting clean was, I couldn't play basketball with my son. He, my son lives for basketball and I could whip his ass with, you know, with the, with the right. Not for long. <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> no, I said I could. I oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't but know how when old you, he is. But when you're hampering yourself, waking, coming over, hung over and, and overweight, it's like, and he kicks your ass and you're like, oh, I'm going to get you, you <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> but yeah, it's like living. What is it? That, being, being, ill makes a coward out of everybody. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's just the truth. And when you're, and when your self-inflicted wounds are getting in the way of just basic enjoyment. And you know, it's funny that you just brought up Jerry Seinfeld. He had said this last stand up he had, he said, no one wants to be anywhere. <laughs> yeah. You can't wait. That's me. So literally, I mean, literally since Sage passed versus even being sober a long time, I'm just in the, like right now I'm literally here. Sitting at the table talking to Jack versus I'm always like, okay, what time's my flight? Uh, what, what, what are we doing tomorrow? When's vacation? I couldn't wait to get on vacation. A vacation. I'm like, oh God, it's almost over <laughs> by the second day. <laughs> and by the fourth day, you're like, I want to go home. The, the I'm gift, done here. <laughs> the, oh yeah, totally. Yeah, I just want to be somewhere else. Just want to feel different. Just want to be somewhere different. Um, 
and that that is that is a difference in where I'm kind of now. Um, is it literally I can I can be in the moment of whatever it is because I'm never gonna have a perfect day ever again. Sounds kind of sad, sounds kind of droopy, not really sad. Actually, kind of a happy thing because if I'm not trying to have a perfect day all the time, I'm pretty good with whatever's going on. Yeah. I'm literally not trying to have a perfect day because it doesn't exist for me here. Yeah. I have a perfect day. You say that, man. When you said I'm never gonna have a perfect day, uh I got no sense of sadness. Yeah. Cause I, I agree. With, like that's the thing. I never had one anyway. <laughs> right. It's never perfect anyway. Right. And some people get really worried about that when you, they always, oh, are you okay? Are you, are you feeling okay? It's like, no, I say that with. Yeah. Like that's a victory. Total victory. <laughs> no, I say that with all like smile and positivity. Cause all the trying to, by the way, I mean the alcohol and drugs, I, I had the perfect moment a few times, but it definitely never lasted Those are a good day. moments. Yeah. I had the perfect <laughs> moment, but it literally, I couldn't get through an hour of it. Um, I just couldn't get another one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do they used to say? A bump will make a new man out of you. The problem is the new man wants a bump too. <laughs> you <know? laughs> keep running out. I mean, there's very, very little satisfaction in that. Yeah. Versus now pretty much, I'm pretty much okay all the time. And that verse is trying to get really happy and then really sad. I don't like, I don't even know what happiness is. Um, joy is something where you're just cool with who you are. Like I know some people that just seem really comfortable with who they are. And those are my North stars now, not the successful people. They might be the same person, but the person who's pretty cool with who they are, no matter what's going on, that's, that's the guy that I'm trying to emulate or, or mimic or be around at least just to be like, Oh, you're pretty cool. No matter what's going on. You're, you're not, it's not like the next thing. I can't wait to do this. I try not to say I can't wait anymore. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait for vacation. I can't wait for vacation to be over. I mean, I go back into the Seinfeld thing, you know, dr- driving around just cause we get to be in so many different places with the, cause of the job I've noticed, uh, you, know, you end up in neighborhoods that look downtrodden and, and, you know, not a good neighborhood. But if you pay attention, man, those old houses that look like they're dilapidated, but if they have a good yard and and the porch looks like it's in order, I've, I've always envied those. I'm like, man, that person is not looking for the next rung of success, the next step on the ladder. Whoever lives in that house has it figured out. Contentment. <laughs> yeah. Contentment's not necessarily what we call success. Um, I went to Haiti years back, you know, mission trip kind of thing. And we went around. Those people were happy. I mean, if they weren't happy, they were faking it really well. Yeah. A lot of smiles. I mean, they had nothing. You're talking about, there was no porch, you know, eight people living in a room smaller than this, you know, but happy because there was, you know, that, 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 uh, that next rung on the ladder thing. It's just a, and I'm, I'm not afraid to win. Like I still enjoy my job. I, I hey man, I, I want hit songs. I want. We're I want gonna to do be. something, do it well. But it's not. It doesn't. I don't lose sleep over either way. I don't. The, the endorphin hit from success now uh, doesn't hit me as hard. But the endorphin hit from, or the opposite of that, from fear of not having it, doesn't hit me at all. Yeah. Like I'm just. It's cool, man. We're gonna be good. We're all so so spoiled and, and rich. I'm addicted to comfort. We're all. You know, I, I told my kids, I said, you don't even know a poor person. You think right. you do, right? but it's just because someone's got an old car. I mean, we're, we live in America. We're, and I, that sounds really kind of peace, love and Donny Osmond hippie. It's not really. Donny <laughs> Osmond <laughs> hippie. <laughs> it's, um, it's just the idea that we're going to be okay. The worry it doesn't really do anything. Yeah. Like it's just, I just, my, if you were to take a 30,000 foot videotape of my life, nothing has changed. I mean, my son's not here, but nothing's changed materially. It's all my perception of it. Right. Or nothing's changed career wise or relate, but my take on it. So it's really all in my head and my heart. My take on it is now that it's fine. This stuff is fine. I'm worried about bigger things. Right. I'm worried about being, being right, having my heart right, knowing God. I need that. But I'm not really, I'm not really worried about the car or the, the, the roof's leaking or the, the, the pool pump broke or whatever. Yeah. Well, when you're living like, it either goes back to songwriting, it goes back to the athletic stuff. It's like Tiger Woods which has said, you know, winning takes care of itself. If you're doing the if you're doing the right things, yeah, then that other stuff is just an outcome of of how you're living. Whether that's sports, career, family, spirituality, it's like, man, if if, you, if your heart's right. And if it's making you miserable, then the chase. 
like what's the chase? You know, this what's the chase about? So, yeah, the I mean, like literally, the successful make people miserable. The, the, we we always Brett and I always joke the worst day in a songwriter's life is the day your song goes number one because the, the climb is over, yeah. the chase is over. You're like this will never happen again. I'm never having a hit. It's like the worst day because then it's over and the ride's over and. Everyone pats you on the back. It's been nice knowing you and you feel like you're out to pasture yeah. and you got to start that struggle all over again. Um, I wouldn't want to start my career with this, with this no level of whatever, but I don't think it really changes that much. Actually, it might've been fine. Like all, all the worrying didn't really do anything. Well, I think the thing about the early part of your career, of anybody's career that makes it in music business or any business really is you talked about it earlier. Like the only thing you got to know when you're young is just don't have a plan B. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. if you if you do, you'll use it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you have something to fall back on, you will. I mean, do you think that we would be like? Okay, this is going to sound funny for me to say. I'm going to put you, but like, if you had never used alcohol and drugs to get there, I don't know what kind of person that is. Too, that's weird, <laughs> right? Right. And I don't. Well, that's what I, I mean. don't want everyone to have a problem and have to get sober. But those are my favorite people. Right. <laughs> the people that have had struggles, whatever struggles they are. And like I said, like we'd mentioned earlier, it's like they're, they're, the, everything served. Its, look, look, here's what I take solace in looking back. Almost inevitably, uh, unceasingly, everything was supposed to happen that way. Like the, 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 the parts that fall, the pieces of the puzzle that fall into place without your control. But when you look back, you go, oh, yeah, yeah that, makes sense. I don't know why that happened. I know why I got dropped from that label. Cause I wasn't yeah. supposed to be on there or whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know why that girl dumped me. And it was worst year of my life. And some, anyone our age that doesn't, hasn't had struggles has heads in their freezer. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't trust them. Like you're lying. Go to rehab. Yeah. You'll find out money doesn't solve yeah. shit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh yeah, I, I always tell my wife. I said, "Hey, we've had a front row seat on the money doesn't make you happy movie." Yeah, you know, it just it just doesn't. But I mean, we've we've been, and it's not that that they're any worse off, but we're all the same. What did, uh, Jim Carrey said? I wish everyone could be rich and famous for a week so they understand it's not the solution. <laughs> right, it's, it's true. not. And then the person that hasn't had those, oh, it's easy for you to say, but the I'd truth like to is, try. Yeah, yeah whatever. Yeah. Like, okay, okay, try. That's <laughs> why I go back to those houses that are in the shittiest neighborhoods, and you go. Whoever lives in there has got it together. I also find envy in that. Like the, the, the yard party and the mom's doing the jump rope for the kids and the dad's sitting in a lawn chair with a 40. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe he, maybe I was like him. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> maybe he's drinking tea. I, I was talking to my dad a couple years back. Uh, I don't, we don't get to talk much. And we were talking about some of this. And I'm like, man, I would love to retire at, to the lake. Because it, there was a, I had a boat. Champagne problem. But it needed fixing. They said they can't look at it for six months because they're packed. I was like, man, I need to start a marina. Take half that dude's business and then we'll both have successful businesses. <laughs> Three months then. I mean, what yeah. Was and, then I, and then I was, then I got real. I was like, if I owned a boat, a marina, and the same the boats were coming in with the same issue, I'd want to go fix that company and make, <laughs> and start doing it better. I was doing it better. Like, like. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's where the envy comes in of like that mom is doing the jump rope dad's slopping the chicken the porch is usable like it's pretty good they're not they're not looking past no. No. today with this personality with yours and mine like we we got this little place in florida and then we're oh, let's retire here and we're gonna buy that coffee shop and run it i'm like Really? <laughs> so I'm sure it's not hard to run a coffee shop on the beach and have to worry about your employees getting stoned and not showing up every right. day and having a lot. And if it is successful, those, you want to franchise it. Yeah, oh yeah, we got more. <laughs> it's it's my, my personality is like another thing is I want to work really hard and then be lazy. Yeah, I don't really want to study like live in the moment life. I want to work really hard and then. Oh, so I'm looking at like, okay, what year do I go? Okay, I'm 60. I'm going to sit on the beach. I'm going to right. sit in a lawn chair, smoke cigars, and I'm never doing anything ever again. And that that's. I mean, there's, there's no, there's no good. End That's to like that. Fogarty. Was it someday never comes? Yeah. Someday. Ne this is someday. Yeah. This is someday. We're getting gray hair. So you're not really. You, uh, no. Blonde people. Neither do you. No, I do. I have a good streak here. Well, at least you're not coloring it. <laughs> no, I'm not, there will be no coloring. <laughs> like your brother. <laughs> coloring He's coloring gray. gray. <laughs> 
So what is your podcast going to be? It's going to be like about grief and, and and God, but like a non-religious talk. So I, I just about people that have had um, struggles. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be just people that have lost children because it's a pretty small, but I kind of just want it to be something. Yeah, you want to be successful. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, I want to be something that I would have wanted that first three months, six yeah. months. I remember being at the beach about three weeks after Sage passed. I was listening to Joe Rogan. I love Joe Rogan and it was cool. And I listened and I thought, don't these people know my kid died? How can they be talking about this? This stupid shit. Meaningless. Meaningless. So I thought, what if there could be something that's lighthearted, uh, lighthearted in a way, as lighthearted as you can go and be real about grief. What What is it? What does it feel like? How do you get through the day? Um, what's your go-to? Um, talking to people about how they got through the tough times that they got through. So um, just like a conversation that's um, a lot like the last half hour you and I have been talking about. Because I will say this. the. Um, you said this earlier when we were talking before the podcast. Um, I don't know. I want to hear I don't know from people. I love being around people where we can have a discussion about God and recovery and grief and all those things, and we can end it with I don't know. We're going to discuss this, but no, I have the answer. There's, there's no magic pill. There's no magic pill. It's a day. It's 24 hours at a time, um, one day at a time. And and I think if there can be a conversation with people just being honest and, it, and ending it with I, I'm not sure, I don't know. It can it can make people feel a little better. Yeah, I agree. And get through it. Get through a time. And it's what good grief, good God, good grief, good God. Which is a little sarcasm in both of those. Of if you want it to be, of course. <laughs> good grief, God. No. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, so I, I'm not really I'm not really completely sure uh, what 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 it'll feel like, but I do think that, um, that it can help somebody cause it's something that I would have been attracted to. Yeah. And, um, well just talk, just the honesty, just some honesty. I mean, I mean the, the relief of being able to go, it's, it's similar to the stuff we talked about, about being with other alcoholics. It's like, Oh, you hid your shit in the laundry basket too. Me too. Under the seat of the car. All the things. The box. All the things yeah. that you thought were your secret. And it's, it's the same with grief. It's like, oh, so you wanted to cut yourself to feel what it, whatever it is. You didn't dark. feel like you could parent your other children. Yes. And I felt like that was the worst thing. And I'm like, oh, I can't parent my other children. Every single person felt that way. So it's just kind of saying things that you wouldn't bring up at church. But <laughs> should. Whatever, but probably should. Um, and those kind of things and just hearing somebody honestly talk about what they've been through when it's tough. If you're having that tough time, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's just like every recovery group, somebody that identifies with your shortcomings. Yeah. I mean, you know, I have a question for you that I wanted to ask a while back. Um, do you, do you ever ride alone? No. Have you ever? Well, what you I did have, when you were a kid. I did when I was a kid and uh, I've written like, Brent's written a couple things on his own. I don't think we've even demoed. I've written a couple things on it, but we, we've been right. We've just write together. Um, this podcast I'm doing will be the first thing we've done apart business-wise almost. I mean, he teaches a class at Lipscomb <laughs> University. We do some things and we write together. It's he does just, a lot on his own. You just, he just, it's just not NDAs. successful. <laughs> People can't tell you about it. You your little feelings hurt. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's actually writing under a pseudo name and it's been yeah. successful. And I, don't even I know go around with him all the time. <laughs> yeah, he, he came up here. He didn't tell you about that. Uh, yeah, probably so. Yeah, I don't write alone. It's crazy. Do you have any? Have you ever thought about it? I don't really want to. I'll tell you this. What's funny? So when 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 you're having a crappy day writing, but your brother's there. Oh yeah, it's pretty good. When you're tired of doing this, when you're on an airplane and you're flying to Abilene, we literally did a show in Raleigh. And we got two hours of sleep. And then we flew to Abilene last month um, and played a show that night. I was totally sleep deprived. If I was by myself, I would have just gotten a flight home. I was so tired. But you're with your brother and you laugh it off. And you, um, at this point, I don't really want to do it. It's, it's become, um, I don't know, maybe we need to go to CODA meetings because I'm codependent. <clears throat> but What's we, your thing? Um, I, mean I don't really, yeah, I don't really have the desire. I mean, maybe one day, I don't know. I don't know what will happen. Maybe one of us will, will want to retire before the other one. I'm not sure how that will work, but. It's fun that the hit songs that we have are all together and we go play them. And we're so in that aspect, we're still the Warren brothers. We don't really have to do a record. We go perform and all of the songs that we've written that somebody might know we've written together. 
And it makes, honestly, I shouldn't say tolerable, but it makes this business tolerable sometimes just having your brother two feet away. Yeah. Are there times when you wish that you had like your best friend and brother, like on the plane with you? Absolutely. You, that's we. I mean, I think it's kept Absolutely. me in the business, kept me caring. Yeah. La- laughing in an airport at 5 a.m. Exactly. Is the best. And man, if you're by yourself laughing in the airport at 5 a.m., they commit you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? You're on your way to rehab <laughs> yeah, again. Just, yeah. <laughs> again. Thanks, man. Love you, brother. Appreciate Love you. you. Too. Yeah, Thanks man. It's out. great. Thank you.